Lectures Committee who are co-sponsoring this. I'd like to thank you for coming. Um, this is obviously a uh, very significant speech for this year and a very controversial one with someone who has definitely established some credentials as a uh, heavyweight in the nuclear controversy and is taken as such by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Uh, some of the consequences of being taken very seriously are going to be discussed in terms of a new decision that has come down from the Nuclear Regulatory Con Commission concerning access to public information in these fields, something that Dr. Judith Johnsrud is going to discuss. Dr. Johnsrud is a visiting assistant professor at Bucknell University in Pennsylvania, where she teaches geography. She has a uh, PhD in geography from Pennsylvania State University, where she did a dissertation on the geographic politics of nuclear power in Pennsylvania. She's the co-director of the Environmental Coalition on Nuclear Power, which was founded in 1970 and has a list of organizational achievements that I'll get into in a minute. She's also now the chairperson of Solar Lobby, the national organization lobbying for legislation for solar programs, which grew out of the Sunday activities of May 1978. She is the founder of a very significant group on the East Coast called the Eastern Federation of Nuclear Opponents and Safe Energy Proponents was on the Environmental Advisory Group to the President's Interagency Review Group on Radioactive Waste Management, and was a public interest legal representative, researcher, and witness before the Nuclear Regulatory Commission's Atomic Safety and Licensing Boards as an intervener in the Three Mile Island Unit 2 operating license proceedings, which are going to be the main subject of the talk, and in proceedings for two other reactors, for 11 other reactors, I'm sorry. Limerick 1 and 2 near Philadelphia, Fulton 1 and 2, Susquehanna 1 and 2, Three Mile Island Unit 1, which went online four years before the one that had the accident, Peach Bottom 2 and 3, and New Bold Island 1 and 2, obviously virtually covering all of eastern Pennsylvania in terms of the operating license and construction license hearings of the last few years. To give you a sense of the effectiveness of Dr. Johns Rudd in her activities in dealing with the nuclear establishment, I'd like to run through some highlights. And these are just highlights of the organizational accomplishments of the Environmental Coalition on Nuclear Power. The cancellation of the project, Plowshare Project Catch in central Pennsylvania by public political opposition in 1968, at a time when nuclear opposition was not all that obvious in most parts of the country. The project was a feasibility study for a proposal to detonate more than 1,050 kiloton nuclear bombs underground to create storage chambers for natural gas. Also responsible for cancellation of a proposal by the Pennsylvania Electric Company to site the demonstration liquid metal fast breeder reactor, now the Clinch River breeder in Tennessee, in northeastern Pennsylvania in 1970. Also responsible for the abandonment of the energy park concept by a consortium of four Pennsylvania utilities in response to statewide political opposition coordinated by the Environmental Coalition on Nuclear Power in 1975. Also withdrawal of a proposal to site a commercial low-level radioactive waste disposal facility in Pennsylvania following opposition by the Environmental Coalition on Nuclear Power in 1976. Very significantly in the TMI hearings, and a subject which I believe she's going to address, admission by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission in those hearings of its failure to account for the largest single long-term source of radioactivity in the nuclear fuel cycle and vacation of the radon number from the federal 
regulatory code for nuclear energy, Table S3 in Three Mile Island Unit 2 operating license proceedings conducted by Drs. Chauncey Kepford of Pennsylvania and Dr. Johns Rudd in 1977 and 78. Needless to say, that is rather long track record, one that continues to be taken seriously by the industry and one that has caused us to feel that this would make a very important program, especially in light of what happened at Three Mile Island earlier this year. To explain those events, I'd like to present to you Dr. Johns Rudd. This microphone is going to do. Is it humming? Let's hope I can keep it from humming too much. Jim, thank you very much for your very kind introduction. It would be nice to feel that I could take credit for the many accomplishments of the Environmental Coalition on Nuclear Power that you have referred to. And in part, I would say, yes, I can, but only in the sense that all active citizens in the state of Pennsylvania who saw questions and problems that had been unresolved prior to the plans of the then Atomic Energy Commission and more recently Nuclear Regulatory Commission to construct and operate nuclear facilities in our state I came to my concern about nuclear energy more than a decade ago. In fact, out of several decades of having read the literature, of having pondered the meaning of our national use of nuclear weapons in World War II, and of having considered as a geographer the total system of production associated with the use of nuclear energy. My concerns as a citizen have arisen out of my understanding of the impacts of radiation in the environment in ever accumulating amounts. From a technology that is controlled by uh, utility companies primarily, and is used for purposes of profit to investor-owned utility companies at what I have come to feel is the expense of public health and safety. I have felt as the years have passed that I, I came to have an obligation to, to try to expand my academic background and my academic concerns to a much broader forum of public education on the basis of my very deep belief that people in a democratic society do have a right to knowledge, to information, and to participate in the decision-making processes for events, activities that will affect their lives, and certainly activities that will affect the lives of future people as well. And so for much of the last 10 years, while <clears throat> struggling along in my spare time trying to finish my doctorate, well, it's more than 10 years now, a dozen years or so, uh, I was also responding to requests from citizen groups in our state for information, for assistance, for the uh, uh, provision of testimony in license proceedings, and other assistance in bringing the issue as a political issue to the decision making of the people who would be affected. In a very real sense, those of us who became involved more than a decade ago in the nuclear power, what has become the nuclear power controversy over the years, 
felt that through the history of the development of atomic energy, there really had never been an opportunity for citizens to have the kinds of information that they needed for informed decision making. There was a time when one had to go to Washington, D.C. to the so-called public documents room of the old Atomic Energy Commission and stand at a little window where a none too friendly lady would say, well, what do you want? And if you didn't know the number of the document and the name and the publication time and place and so on, you're out of luck. You never got hold of the information you wanted. Well, over the years, I've, I have felt that there has come to be a much more open attitude on the part of not only what became the Nuclear Regulatory Commission in 1974, but also many other government agencies that wherein there, there came to be a welcoming of participation on the part of the public in the decision-making processes. Certainly those in Pennsylvania who had come actively to oppose the nuclear industry in the late 1960s and the early 1970s discovered early on that the most effective way to oppose a nuclear project was to oppose it early, to oppose it politically, to oppose it without the necessities of employing attorneys and mounting publicity campaigns, and without the necessities of turning to civil disobedience, to demonstrations, uh, to moves of desperation that I think we have seen in the last two or three years as the nuclear controversy has become much more uh, visible in the media. For those of us who, however, were not able to prevent the implementation of certain nuclear projects because they'd gotten started before we got started, I guess is the way to put it, there was a last resort of attempting to participate in the provided licensing procedures of the administrative agency in charge, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and its predecessor. We as citizens, and I say this somewhat collectively nationwide for the many people who as individual citizens have gone into reactor licensing proceedings, we as citizens concluded in some instances that if it was impossible to prevent a reactor from going online, from being used, from beginning to become radioactive waste and to produce radioactive waste in the absence of a solution of, for the disposal of such waste, that at least we would want to go through the process of the licensing to try to make such plants as safe as possible for the people who had to live with them. In 1974, my colleague, Dr. Kepford, who was a radiation chemist by training, a uh, stubborn so-and-so by <laughs> avocation, uh, and a determined man from conviction, Dr. Kepford filed a petition to intervene in the licensing proceedings for Three Mile Island Unit 2. He had only a matter of a week or two to examine the massive quantity of documentation that is associated with such a licensing, some 15 to 20 volumes, each of them, oh, you know, about five inches thick and, and larger than this and so on, pertaining to both the safety and environmental effects of a reactor. And from that cursory examination, he drew up a number of contentions that related to the plant issues that we wanted to litigate in controversy in opposition to the Metropolitan Edison Company and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, all of whom were proponents of the licensing of the reactor. As everyone now knows, Three Mile Island had been built in the middle of a river. It had been built a matter of just a couple of miles from the Harrisburg International Airport. There were some questions about that airport location in that the plant 
containment structure had been hardened to withstand the crash of an aircraft of 200,000 pounds or greater flying at 200 knots. Well, that's the 747 and the C5A. Uh, it just so happens that the Harrisburg International Airport is uh, also a, a former Air Force base, and uh, C5As used to go lumbering in and out of that airport with a fair degree of frequency. They were brought in in the post-accident period to transport some of the equipment that was used, the filters that were added to the plant shortly after the accident began. We litigated, attempted to litigate also, issues having to do with the adequacy of the radiation monitoring in the vicinity of the plant and the emergency response planning and evacuation planning. We couldn't afford attorneys, and so we learned, with not a day of law training, learned to be what, if you'll forgive me the jest, we tend to call a kangaroo attorney in a kangaroo court. Now, that's a loaded statement, and, and please forgive me for having made it. I, I say it because in the licensing context, which perhaps if you've never attended one, you aren't aware of this, in the licensing context, we as two citizen interveners were in opposition to a battery of attorneys of the utility, a battery of attorneys from the regulatory commission, and another from the state, a room full of expert witnesses for each of those parties, a licensing board composed of employees of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and a couple of citizens who found some things wrong with the plant. I think you should understand also that in the entire history of the licensing of nuclear power reactors, there has never been a denial of a commercial license to any utility that has applied for one for either construction or operation of a nuclear power plant. The hearings lasted much of a year. Well, mm. No, it just seemed like much of a year come to think of it. It was really only April through July, seemed a lot longer. Lengthy sessions of cross-examination of their witnesses, the utilities and the regulatory commissions, because we as citizens simply had not the funds to bring in expert witnesses. In the course of the licensing of that plant, however, the NRC staff itself introduced a testimony relating to the health effects of the comparative coal and nuclear uranium fuel cycles, all the way from the initial mining of the fuel through whatever fabrication, refining and fabrication processes for each, the operations of the plants, and then finally the disposals of the wastes. And that was an extraordinary opportunity because under the rules and regulations of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, it had always been prohibited for citizens to raise questions concerning the nuclear fuel cycle in the course of the proceedings. They simply were not allowed. The reason was that a standardized table had been adopted by the agency that supposedly accounted for the land that was used, the uh, uh, emissions to the atmosphere of various radioactive gases uh, from the reactor, from various parts of the fuel cycle, the water emissions, uh, radioactive waste that's left over at the end, and so forth. So a standard table was applied when a utility did the cost-benefit analysis that is required under environmental impact statements that in turn are required by the National Environmental Policy Act. By the way, if I lapse into the jargon and the alphabet soup uh, in the course of, of what I have to say, please sort of wave your hands or stand on your heads or something and ask me what I'm talking about. I'll, I'll try to avoid such, but it gets to be kind of second nature, I guess. Now, what my colleague Dr. Kepford had done over the previous several years had been to examine 
uh, a lengthy rule-making proceeding of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission in which thousands of pages of testimony and documentation were forwarded to us as parties in that proceeding. And out of it, he had come to the conclusion that there was a very serious mistake in that standardized table that was used in calculating the cost-benefit analysis. The mistake had to do with one apparently innocuous little radioactive isotope, a radon gas, radon-222, that was released from the mill tailings piles that were created at the beginning of the nuclear fuel cycle, and I would assume after the Three Mile Island accident and all of its reportage that you have some sense of the nuclear fuel cycle all the way from the mining through the final disposition of waste. So I won't go into that in detail unless you'd like for me to do so later. But when the ore is first mined and milled, it has, of course, a very small uranium content relative to the body of ore, and that uranium has to be removed in a milling process that involves the crushing of the rock. <laughs> only about, well, it's, it's economically recoverable to get only about 90, 95% of the uranium. So a little bit is left in the tailings piles that are a fine sand that's left behind. In addition, other radioactive components that are decay products of the uranium in its original state remain with those mill tailings. And that includes uh, thorium-230 that has an 80,000 year half-life, and radium-226 that has 1,600 year half-life. And the radium-226 in turn decays into this innocuous little radon gas that has only a 3.8 day half-life, but is available for release seeping out of that fine sand to become an inhalation dose in the vicinity of the mill tailings, most of which are to the west of here, in Colorado, Utah, Nevada, no, not Nevada, uh, New Mexico, Wyoming, and so forth. And also, the radon is carried eastward with the prevailing winds and decays through its radon daughter products that are very short-lived into a radioactive lead that in turn then, as the half-life of 3.8 days expires, is converted to, well, the lead 210 is deposited and becomes available for uptake in the food crops of the grain belt, the wheat and corn belt of the United States, and hence, in turn, becomes part of the food chain. Now, what Dr. Kepford was able to establish in the licensing proceedings for Three Mile Island a matter that the national press in all the millions of words that have now been written about that reactor toward which I have such tender feelings, uh, was this, that the NRC was accounting for only the first year's release of that radon gas. But the next year, because all those other residual radioactive materials were still in the mill tailings piles, there would be an equal amount of radon released and the following year, another equal amount of radon, year after year after year, for each annual fuel requirement. These tons of mill tailings piles adding up year after year, and from each of those piles, for each year's fuel supply, the curies of radon would be released to the environment. Not much in any one year only about 75 curies, according to the NRC's calculations. But over the full period of toxicity, which is indeed the time that the courts have established to be the time period for NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Act, that radon adds up to be the largest long-term source of radioactivity in the entire nuclear fuel cycle. And what Kepford did in turn was to assume that the U.S. population wouldn't change over the millennia ahead, but in fact would remain at around 200 million. So a kind of neutral calculation was going on here. He projected into the future to get some, con some, some concept of what the total health impact would be. And using the EPA models and the NRC's models for the relationship between the curies of radon released, and the doses that would be received by members of the public downwind. 
he calculated that over that long, long millions of years of toxicity, there would be the equivalent of a million or more human deaths associated with each annual fuel requirement for a single reactor. Well, nobody's going to die from it today, at least that we could identify. And yet this is a commitment in terms of the physical processes of radioactive decay and the biological processes of concentration in the food chain, as well as the inhalation doses, that represents a major long-term impact of the nuclear fuel cycle. Ironically and tragically to us, we had taken this case to the U.S. Court of Appeals, and in a split decision with the recently deceased Mr. Justice Charles Fahey, a wonderful old man, coming out of his retirement to hear the case, but in a split decision, the three-man panel refused to revoke the license and give a permanent injunction against the operation of Three Mile Island. We went back to the agency. We exhausted our administrative procedures, which is necessary in the law, in the summer of 1978, at the time that the plant was cranking up to start in December. And in September, oh my, September 21st, a year ago, we filed a petition for review of this case to bring it up before the court again on its merits. And the court failed to act in the months that followed until after the accident at Three Mile Island had taken place. I'd like to try to tell you about that accident. There are, there are really three topics I would like to cover with you. I don't know how your patience is. I hope it's reasonable. I'm going to run over, I'm afraid. Are you willing for me to talk for a while longer? I'm just getting started. The three topics I want to discuss with you are, first, the degree to which the accident at Three Mile Island is still in progress. It is not over. And I have found, as I've traveled around the country, speaking on various topics relating to nuclear energy and solar energy, I have found that most people in most parts of the country really have no idea of the fact that central Pennsylvania is, again, some loaded language for which, forgive me, is still living in terror. And I use that term quite advisedly. Because I get telephone calls at 1 o'clock in the morning from people who live near the river, who hear the monitoring helicopters going over their houses in the middle of the night, who see the fire engines going on site, who see the, the, the billows of steam, even now, six months later, emanating from the cooling towers and from other structures on the island. The plant is not at cold shutdown, contrary to the impression that most of us have. It went to convective cooling, which if you listen to the careful language of the NRC carefully, you would find was called, in essence, cold shutdown a month after the accident. But the temperatures still exceed the boiling point in some parts of that core. The core is severely damaged. The extent of that damage is still not known, but it appears to be on the order of 40% of the fuel cladding burned, which in turn results in the, at minimum, there, may, there, there is still the possibility that they will find melted fuel when they get in, but at minimum there is a crumbling of those little fuel pellets. Instead of standing up in their nice long pencil thin rods with pellet on top of pellet, once they lost their cladding, of course, they shattered because of the high internal temperatures during the uh, fission process. And uh, they were described to us by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission as, uh, staff as being of a consistency somewhere between popcorn and granola. Creative language on the part of the NRC. 
so the fuel is, is in a very serious condition. That protection provided by the cladding, one of the lines of defense is missing for much of the re reactor and its internals. Water continues to seep out of the primary coolant system. And of course, they still must maintain a water flow in the convective cooling system to keep that core cooled because there is still decay heat. Therefore, as the water continues to rise in the containment building, there is a continuing hazard there as well. At present, there is still no system on the site developed and constructed for the cleaning, the decontamination of the high activity water in the containment building. It appears to be from the last report we had, and I'm trying to be conservative here, on the order of some 600,000 gallons of radioactive water contaminated with primary coolant in the containment structure, the basement, and rising to a level somewhere on the order of seven plus feet. At eight feet, we have been told by the state, there are controls, well actually, the NRC has told us this, there are controls that uh, may give them some problems, and they're very much concerned about that continued slow rise in the water level. In addition, there's some 300,000 gallons of moderately contaminated water still stored in the auxiliary building. The <laughs> decontamination systems for radioactive water that were built into the plant were designed to handle a maximum of 230,000 gallons of water in a single year and they have on the order of a million gallons of intermediate to high level contamination water sitting there on site. They have a major water control problem ahead. We have found uh, disturbingly within the last two months a release of some 4,000 gallons of radioactive water to the river. Uh, water which was not properly tested for its, season, for its uh, possible strontium content was believed to have been from the adjoining Unit 1 on the site, but was subsequently questioned to have been perhaps in part from Unit 2 as well. There appears to be some question about the use of the two systems, you see, uh, jointly on the same site. I was astonished, having been as a matter of fact, out uh, a bit west of here for much of the month of July to find that when this problem of the 4,000 gallon dump in late time exceeding the technical specifications, but over the period of perhaps 30 to 50 or 60 days being a continual releasing or an off and on releasing of gases to the atmosphere at what they will try to make uh, times for maximum dispersion and hence minimum dose. But such doses will be, as are any further uh, releases to the river, additional amounts of radioactivity over the amounts that have already been received by the public. Furthermore, there is a problem that has not been addressed in the press but is very troubling to our State Director of Radiological Health, who testified both before a Congressional Committee, the Kemeny Commission, and last week, at the same time we did before the State Assembly, to the effect that he fears the worst contamination may well lie ahead over the many, many months, at minimum four years, of anticipated cleanup of that reactor. You see, the barrier of the fuel cladding is gone. When the time comes to go into the reactor to clean up, the head comes off the reactor vessel, and that barrier is gone. And in order to get into the building, once the water is pumped out, that barrier, the containment structure, must be breached as well. Now, that containment structure made of concrete was never designed as a swimming pool. And yet, it's eight feet deep in water. And that water has been seeping slowly for six months into the concrete itself. That radioactive water is contaminated with both strontium and cesium. 
So far as we know, there had not been releases of strontium and cesium in marked amounts in the early days and weeks of the accident. But they, those two isotopes are, of course, a biological contaminant that we're particularly concerned about. Now, iodine-131 has an eight-day half-life. That's long since gone. The xenon-133 gas has about a five-day half-life, and that's pretty well gone. Krypton has a longer half-life, 10 years or so, and so that's going to stick around for a while. Tritium that would be released in the water to the river has a 10 or so year half-life. But strontium-90, as all of you should understand, since all of you bear it in your bones, your skeleton absorbed, built into your structure when you were children in the late 50s, in consequence of fallout from atmospheric testing. Strontium and cesium both have about a 30-year half-life. And thus, any contamination of the agricultural lands of southeastern Pennsylvania and the Susquehanna Valley or of Chesapeake Bay, into which the Susquehanna empties, will be contamination that will continue for some two or three hundred years at levels that may be damaging biological life. So it's a very serious problem. How are they going to go in there, scrub down the walls of the containment structure to reduce the radioactivity without running into problems of dust, plain old dust? How can the filter systems be assured when, in fact, the systems have failed thus far to contain fully? the radioactive gases or water in that reactor. This is the problem that our director of radiological health finds most troubling. He's very concerned. He does, in fact, along with some of us, see the potential for the necessity, even at this late date, for evacuation of some of the areas in the vicinity of the reactor. The accident is not over. The accident is ongoing. And I think that is perhaps an aspect of the functioning of a nuclear power plant that we really have never had to face before. There's a second major aspect that I'd like to talk to you about that relates to the doses and to the severity of the accident. For here again, it is my belief that the press has been unable to serve us as citizens as well as we deserved. At the time of the accident at Three Mile Island, many of us who were well acquainted with the reports of the old Atomic Energy Commission dating back for more than 20 years, realized the potential for very serious contamination of not just the immediate vicinity of the plant, but a far larger area of the eastern seaboard. The reactor accident began on a day when a weather system had started to stagnate in central Pennsylvania. A stagnant air mass sat over the Susquehanna Valley for some six days with light and variable winds moving back and forth at two, three, five miles per hour or simply sitting there. With a temperature inversion, a condition which is very common, of course, in the river valleys of the east and elsewhere in the country, with a temperature inversion that gave a capping or a lid, if you will, such that the radioactive contaminants that were released were unable to disperse and dissipate as they're supposed to in the models. Now, in a report that the old Atomic Energy Commission had released in 1957 as a justification behind the institution of the Price-Anderson Nuclear Insurance Liability Law in the Atomic Energy Act, in that 1957 study that's known as the Brookhaven Report, the old Atomic Energy Commission had given a reservation at the very beginning that the consequences of a major accident in a major nuclear power plant 
that were described in that report omitted the worst case consequences in which the weather systems involved a stagnant air mass and temperature inversion. Now they estimated for the US as a whole that those weather conditions would be experienced no more than 5% of the time. In central Pennsylvania, in the Susquehanna Valley, we have found them to be characteristic some 30% of the time. And indeed, that was what happened. Now, think about it. You've all seen smoke <coughs> rising. Here's our reactor. We get the release of radioactivity. We've got a temperature inversion layer up here that will cap, prevent the rise. So what happens? You get a dispersal, all right, but that's what it will look like. And at some distance that may vary depending upon winds, upon downdrafts, variety of other reasons, at some <coughs> distance from the reactor, the radioactive plume touches down to ground. In the first four days of the accident, contrary to the assurances that we had been given in the licensing proceeding, that the NRC would fly teams of specialists in who would simply be tripping over each other in the field trying to do the monitoring. Instead, the NRC did not install a single ground thermoluminescent dosimeter monitor near the plant. The utility had only 20 such monitors in place, and they were widely scattered so that there were some compass sectors in which there was no monitoring whatsoever, including compass sectors in which the wind was blowing. Thus, in those first critical days of the accident, we have no way of knowing in actuality precisely where the plume touched ground. DOE came in, the Department of Energy, and they were monitoring with their helicopters up here in the plume, but not at ground level where the people were. Uh, the NRC did install 37 monitors on March 31st, and those were scattered around in the vicinity of the plant. It looked something like this. Let's say here is the reactor. And then if we draw the concentric circles at 10 miles and 20 miles distance and outward, what we find, well, let's see. They, they actually were considering in their subsequent assessments of the population doses, they were considering outward only to 50 miles. So is what I'm doing here clear? We can take a look at the compass sectors away from the plant. The, north, the north, northeast, uh, north, northeast, I guess it was, and then the northeast sector and so forth. And we find here toward the northwest, the city of Harrisburg at 10 miles, the city of Lebanon off here to the northeast at 20 miles, the city of Lancaster in the east-southeast direction at 20 miles, the city of York, in the southerly sector at about 12 miles and so forth around the compass. But in no one of these sectors was there more than five or six at the most monitoring devices. And most of those were placed within the first five miles. The farthest distance that the NRC monitored was 13.8 miles through the 7th of April. The kinds of monitors that were in place registered the gamma doses, but according to testimony of EPA before Congressional Committee back in May, not the beta dose of radiation that's associated with the largest component of the gaseous releases, the xenon-133. And so, at best, we have a very faulty kind of measurement available 
for the real doses that may have been received. In late June, on June 21st, an NRC staff person testified before the commissioners that the morning of the accident, the stack monitors at the reactor went off scale such that there is no way of knowing how much radioactivity did actually escape in those first several days. Now, subsequent to the initial scare of the accident, perhaps you recall in mid-May that Secretary, then Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare, Califano, sometimes, again, sort of in a jaundiced way, some of us begin to think that it's the Secretary of not terribly much health, education, or welfare. Uh, Secretary Califano, who's been a pretty good guy on questions like smoking, you know, uh, published the results of a population dose assessment based upon these preliminary NRC and Metropolitan Edison Company data, in which the estimate was made for the two million people living within the 50-mile radius of the plant that there would be no more than one or two or maybe up as high as 10 cancer deaths. Perhaps you recall hearing those estimates. And that would be in a, a population that would experience uh, many, many thousands of cancer deaths over the next 20, 30 years or so. And thus, the health consequences, the health effects, which is a, a sort of nuclear industry euphemism for premature death from cancer, uh, the health effects were discounted. The accident was not considered serious from a health standpoint. Now, my colleague Kepfer took a look at this ad hoc population dose assessment report of May 10th. And he looked at the, <clears throat> the distribution of the dosimeters and found that in the directions of, for instance, Lebanon and Lancaster and here to the north-northeast, Hershey, where the pregnant women and children were evacuated to, well, pretty close in, that's less than 10 miles, like so. There were virtually no monitors at all. And then he thought, what would the plot of the actual data that we do have look like in comparison with the dose assessment that was used by the NRC? And this is what he found when he did such a plot. I hope we be able to see it if it's down this far. Nah. We'll take off the plume for the moment. Just remember what that looked like, please. And let's say that we're plotting the total number of milli-rem in that first week of the accident, according to the NRC's data. Well, this is from March 31st through the 7th of April. And compare that then with distance from the plant out as far as the monitoring took place, which was 13.8 miles at ground level, okay? Now, the model that was used to estimate that only one or two cancer deaths would occur within that 50-mile radius in the 2 million population assumed a fall-off with distance. Get the dispersion. So the dose goes down very rapidly as you move away from the point source. And the curve looks like that. Can you see this from, it's an awfully big room and you're spread out. OK, fine. So for each of these little dosimeters, oh, <laughs> this is kind of funny. When, he, when we testified before uh, Congressional Committee, the congressman from Lancaster, Pennsylvania, was very upset at what Dr. Kepford had to say because it just didn't match with what the agency had been saying. It was re very reassuring. And he said, uh, well, I've looked at that report, and, and they show dosimeters out at, at uh, uh, Lancaster and Lebanon and all these towns. The chairman of that committee 
Congressional Committee is a congressman from Hanford, Washington, which is, of course, a, a nuclear facility in the state of Washington, who cut off uh, Kefford's response as he was trying to explain that in this report, the little dots indicated the location of the city, whereas the monitoring devices are clearly shown and labeled on each of these maps. I was very concerned that the congressman didn't understand and therefore was discounting. So after lunch, we went in to see him, walked into his office. He he's uh, had been a rapidly pro-nuclear congressman for many years. Didn't even let us open our mouths, he said. I called the NRC right after, after that session, and he said, you were right. They've been lying to me. That congressman <laughs> is approaching nuclear energy in Pennsylvania with a rather different point of view today. Okay. What Kefford did then here was to plot what the dose should have been at each of those monitoring sites in terms of distance according to the model that the NRC had used. You follow this? Then for comparative purposes to see if the model fit the real world data, he plotted for each of these sectors what the doses actually did look like from the data of the NRC. And in the directions toward the south and southeast, there was a rapid decline from a monitoring station at, let's say, two miles, and then at one, four miles, and six, and eight, and 10, and out as far as they went to 14 miles, OK? So the plots looked something like this in the south, southeast, northeast directions for the limited amount of data. But in every instance, while they followed the general shape of the curve, the doses recorded were substantially higher up on the curve. Now, we're dealing here only with a few millirem that were actually recorded at those monitors. And I want to make that clear. It's a range of, oh, up on this scale, we go up perhaps as high as 25 or 30 millirem uh, at the very top. But most of these doses, when we got out at beyond two miles or so, fell in the uh, 10 or fewer millirem level. Okay? That's what was recorded on those dosimeters that picked up only a portion of the dose. But what disturbed us was to find that in some sectors, rather than falling off with distance, there was an initial drop off. And then as far out as the monitoring went, an absolutely level dose. It did not decline with distance beyond the first couple of miles. And most disturbing, in the direction southward toward the city of York, there was an initial drop off. And then beginning at about four miles to six or eight miles of rise, and then a bit of a decline. Well, we're still more or less within the pattern of the model. However, for the plot toward Harrisburg, where the people were, up the Susquehanna Valley, the dose <coughs> pattern looked like this, out to about four miles rose at six to eight, about six miles, and then rose markedly to a higher level at 10 miles before it began to drop off as far out as the monitoring went. And that's where the bulk of the people were. Now, I can't take this terribly much farther, except to suggest to you that this plot suggests to us the inadequacy of the model that was used to reassure people that the doses were very small at distances away from the reactor. If the model doesn't fit the data in the first 14 miles, what justification have we for extending it out to 50 miles? And I leave that question open to you. To confirm this uh, question, however, 
we had been doing some independent monitoring at various dates immediately following the accident. For example, um, the day following the April 8th and again following the April 15th, substantial releases of radioactive iodine. And in both those instances, we found that at distances ranging between 20 and 30 miles, that the radiation levels that our Geiger counter, a civil defense instrument, showed were between 5 and 50 times natural background, while close to the plant, it read normal background. Again, it raises a question that we feel has not been adequately resolved. More recently, in another reactor licensing proceeding, Dr. Kepford was asked to serve as a consultant for a township in New Jersey where a utility wants to expand the spent fuel storage at its reactor to put about 15 years worth of spent fuel on a single site. And the licensing board in that proceeding asked, what happens if we have a class nine accident? Class nine accident is an accident in which the safety systems fail to design as function, uh, I've said that twice today, fail to function as designed and release more radioactivity to the environment than either the technical specifications uh, allow or certainly than the design basis accidents allow. Another thing you've got to understand about nuclear power plants and their licensing is that the NRC has a procedure that disallows the examination of what are termed low probability events. A low probability event is one to which the number of uh, 10 to the minus 7, 1 in 10 million is attached. And always in the past it has been assumed that the so-called class 9 accident where the safety systems failed to function as designed was a low probability event. In this instance, the licensing board said, what happens if we have a class 9 accident and have to abandon the site because of high radioactivity, leaving behind a spent fuel pool that's full of 10 or 15 years of spent fuel? And then they lose the water with this compacted spent fuel. Well, it turns out that what happens is that uh, if they lose the water, they don't get a removal of the decay heat, and they get a heat up such that the fission products sort of slowly cook out, and a slow melt of the fuel can ensue over a period of many weeks or so, and it becomes a very serious kind of accident that had never been analyzed. Then the licensing board said, well, are we going to have to look at this problem? Was Three Mile Island a class nine accident. And on August 24th, little reported by the press, the staff of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission responded to that question and concluded that the accident at Three Mile Island was indeed a class nine accident. The Duane Arnold reactor here in Iowa, when it was licensed, was not examined for an accident of that severity. The consequences of the many, many sequences of events that can take place were never looked at. The potential for damage was never made clear. Now, as I went back during the accident to the NRC's documents, being very concerned about the magnitude of the event. <clears throat> I remembered that old Brookhaven report and a revision of it that took place in 1964 and 65 to examine the consequences that could happen to a large 1,000 megawatt reactor. And what I found in the heat of the accident, if you will, was sort of distressing. The NRC for a 1,000 megawatt reactor, which was about the size of Three Mile Island, but one that had operated for 1,000 days, which is close to three years on the same fuel supply. In the event of a breach of containment that was a mere half square meter, would, according to the NRC, 
AEC at that time, pardon me, have released levels of radiation to the environment such that at, and I'm quoting, at 100 kilometers, which would be about 60 miles, the levels were still 100 times the protective action guide, which is where you evacuate. And I quote, the result if a city were involved would be catastrophic and there would be deaths out to 150 kilometers. That's 90 miles. They'd go on to say it would take one hour to melt 50% of the fuel from full power and one day for 100%. Now, we'd had a peculiar kind of accident at Three Mile Island. It happened and yet it didn't happen as class nine accidents are supposed to go. We had four or five days after the initial release, which may or may not have been large, in which to evacuate. Ordinarily, in a breach of containment or core melt accident, that amount of time would not be available. I was particularly troubled that for people in the downwind sectors of the eastern seaboard, especially given the variability of the winds and that stagnant air mass that we knew sometime was going to start to move, as the days passed, they were not informed of the kinds of actions they could take to mitigate the consequences of exposure should a core melt and breach of containment take place. They could have drawn water in advance. They could have laid in food supplies against the possibility of the disruption of the distribution system. They could have gotten medicines required, prescription medicines that their families might need. They could have kept themselves indoors listening to find out where the plume was headed. The one thing they wouldn't have wanted to do was hop in the family car and run how would you know what direction to run? How far could you go in the eastern United States on one tank of gas without running into people running from the opposite direction into you? Besides which, you'd be as likely as not to put yourself under the plume instead of getting away from it. Then you'd be out in the open. Well, all of these, all of these aspects were never, never broadcast to the people of the eastern seaboard to take protective action to be prepared to take protective action. And instead, the notion of the limitation of the consequences of the event was cordoned off, if you will, at 20 miles radius of the plant where finally they considered evacuation. I have to tell you that when that plant was licensed, the licensing board literally prohibited me from questioning about evacuation planning beyond 4.8 miles of the plant. The civil defense director in charge is a former radio disc jockey whose training in radiological health consisted of a one week course who said under oath, an accident is an accident is an accident. No, I can't define a radiation injury. I don't consider a radiological event different from any other kind of accident. That was the level of preparedness which I submit is still characteristic in much of the United States in the vicinity of nuclear power facilities. The people at a great distance were not prepared. The people close in, in the weeks following the accident, reported symptoms that are commonly associated with radiation poisoning. Symptoms of sore throats, of diarrhea, of nausea, of skin disorders, a burning sensation of the eyes, a metallic taste in the throat. And I'm puzzled. I don't know what that means, if anything. But the reportage of such such symptoms was widespread enough among people living both close to the plant and in the 10 miles radius and beyond to raise the question in my mind and in part to do so because I was myself there uh, in the direct path of the plume on the morning of the third day of the accident, the Friday morning release. At the time, 
the wind direction, wind speed, and so forth, to have been within the plume, and to have experienced this very sudden closing soreness of the throat. You know, I'll chalk a wave of nausea up to a certain amount of stress, which everyone in, in that area felt, but I don't get stressed, sore throats. I don't know about other people. At any rate, I don't know what it means, but I would suggest two possibilities to, three possibilities to you. Perhaps there's no relationship. Perhaps that is indicative of the fact that in a large population exposure, what we have may be the good old-fashioned bell-shaped curve in which the bulk of the population wasn't sensitive enough or susceptible enough to low levels of radiation, if indeed the low levels are what we, we experienced in Pennsylvania. But a portion of the population lies out here at the edge of the curve with a higher sensitivity. After all, some of us are more susceptible to pollens during the hay fever. NRC and data from Metropolitan Edison Company associated with their calculation of a design basis accident when they licensed the plant. The design basis accident is the one where the systems are supposed to function so that you have a couple of hours to evacuate people from the so-called exclusion zone close to the plant and several days, many 30 days, to evacuate from a two miles radius. And what he found was to give you just a suggestion of the comparison here, that the NRC in mid-April had announced that there had been the release of some 13 million curies of xenon-133 in those first couple of weeks. In the worst case design basis accident, the maximum release of xenon had been 88,000 curies. And so all he did was to plug in the figures to the utilities calculational model to translate from curies released to dose received. And <coughs> the figures come up with a troubling dose level that may have been as high. And I say this, please, very guardedly, because we cannot know in this aftermath. But using these data in our C-zone numbers, the doses received in those, that two-mile radius may have run as high as 25 to upward of 150 rem the maximum permissible annual exposure for a member of the general public is only half a rem. The lethal dose to half the people who would be exposed to it runs on the order of 450 to 600 rem. I don't know. I am troubled by the fact that neither does the NRC. But I can tell you that having experienced an unknown but to them much more substantial dose of radiation than they have been told they received, the people of central Pennsylvania are now living with a terrible kind of fear that is associated with even the possibility of Unit 1 on that site going back into service and the fear of possible continued releases from Three Mile Island Unit 2. And finally, to conclude, I am particularly troubled that in the last few days I have received, sort of figured out from some pieces of information in the Federal Register and a couple of pieces of correspondence, that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, rather than assisting us in the public to know more about nuclear power, is headed precisely the opposite direction. For starting on October 31st, the NRC intends to charge at a rate of eight to 10 cents per page for every notice, decision, 
order of the commission, research document, and every other scrap of paper that the NRC publishes, which will have a very serious effect on the right of the public to know, to have access to information. The utilities will be able to purchase these documents and pass the cost through to their customers. So will the rest of the nuclear industry. So will law firms. But we, the citizens, can't afford the thousands upon thousands of dollars worth of documents that are put out every year that tell us what really is happening with respect to nuclear energy. And you have been a most patient audience because I've talked on much, much longer than I intended. And I'll be glad to answer questions as long as you'd like to put them to me. Thank you.